The topic of conversation today is Intel in 2023. Does Intel have great things ahead, or is it in trouble and on the slide? To illustrate this question, I first have a clip of video of myself in conversation with Gamers Nexus Steve from Computex 2019. So you're considered Gamers Nexus take uh, on Intel 2019-2020? Uh, I think they're not dying. Like Intel's what, like a $200 billion market cap? They're fine. And then we have a clip from Computex 2023 of Steve in conversation with Gordon Ung from PC World. I thought the answer to this is Intel screwed might be they're kind of screwed right now. Now, admittedly, I clipped that second video rather brutally. They're actually discussing graphics rather than CPUs, but you see my point. Which is correct? Is it optimistic Gamers Nexus Steve from 2019? Is it somewhat more pessimistic Steve from 2023? Or might there be a third option, a Schrodinger Steve, i.e. we won't know the truth until we look inside the box. As I discuss Intel's past, present and future, I shall be referring to all manner of charts, including roadmaps, such as this, which stretches from the dim and distant past into the near future. This inevitably means I'm going to discuss photolithography, process technology, transistors, DUV, EUV, nanometers and other terms. I don't have any intention here of tackling the details of photolithography, partly because I'm not an engineer, but also because it means we'd be sat here for hours and that would be very dull. There are plenty of other YouTube channels that cover this technology in detail. I personally enjoy Asianometry, which does a very fine job on the subject. There are, however, some key points to remember as you look at charts such as this. For one thing, nanometers. The bigger the number, the older the technology, the smaller the number, the newer technology. But there is also a certain amount of FUD to bear in mind. FUD standing for fear, uncertainty, doubt. It does not necessarily follow that four nanometer is a wholly different process to five nanometer, for example. And that in turn begs the question, when you say 22 nanometer, 14 nanometer or 10 nanometer, what are you actually measuring? And there also we have a certain amount of FUD. There may be some part of the transistor or processor that you can measure and go, that bit there, that is 14 nanometer, whereas that bit's 10 nanometer. You just have to go with the flow and accept that a smaller number represents a newer technology and a larger number represents an older technology. One point I will make in very broad terms, DUV and EUV. In essence, photolithography is like using an overhead projector, if you recall such a thing, where you have a transparent slide on a piece of glass, a light shines through it, it goes through a lens and it casts an image on a screen. Photolithography is kind of like that in the sense that you shine a light, a laser, through a mask, and that casts an image on the target, in this instance, a silicon wafer. And then you have photoresists and you etch and you clean and you repeat as you build up your processor layer by layer. We are, of course, talking about absolutely tiny items when we're discussing silicon chips. So the light in question has a very short wavelength. The snag is the wavelength is not short enough. In an ideal world, let's say you're working at 10 nanometer and you have a silicon wafer and you want to paint a line that's 10 nanometers in width. Ideally, you just do exactly that with light that had a wavelength of 10 nanometers or less. You'd simply go, boom, there's a stripe, just like putting a painted stripe down a piece of tarmac. However, you can't do that. So instead, you define one side of the line with a block, boom, and then you shift your pattern across and you define the other side, leaving that 10 nanometer strip in the center. A bit like uh, shaving a Mohican on someone's head. So DUV uses light of a certain wavelength that is too long for the purposes of photolithography and it makes the process incredibly complicated. EUV uses shorter wavelength light and that is better. However, DUV machines, deep ultraviolet, cost tens of millions of dollars a piece. They come from uh, ASML, a Dutch consortium. 
EUV machines cost something like 150, 160 million dollars a piece and have only just recently gone into production. They are also physically much larger than DUV machines and they are in very short supply. So moving from DUV to EUV is a very good thing, but it brings in a whole host of complications. Also, we've been waiting for EUV for years, many, many years, as we will discuss. Intel publishes technology roadmaps that combine a number of pieces of information. So we have the process in nanometers. We have significant technologies that are used with that process. So for example, take the left-hand side. Intel 90 nanometer introduced strained silicon. Then 65 nanometer enhanced the strained silicon. 45 nanometer high K metal gate and 32 nanometer enhanced high K metal gate. This alternation of a new fabrication process and then a new technology became known as TikTok. You will note, however, this roadmap does not include dates. So let's move on to this marked up roadmap. The dates in red were added by me. So we can see the 90 nanometer process was all the way back in 2003 and 65 nanometer in 2005. Fast forward to 2014 when we had 14 nanometer and then you can see there's quite a large pause before 10 nanometer in 2018. In fact, the pause is even longer than that because the effective release of 10 nanometer was the enhanced process in 2019. We understand Intel had a number of delays in 10 nanometer, but the biggie was EUV. The process and designs relied on EUV technology and EUV machines from ASML simply were not available as they were massively delayed. You may wonder, why was Intel waiting for EUV? Indeed, how did they even know that EUV was a thing? The answer, at least in part, is IMEC, which is the Silicon Industries University based in Belgium. IMEC works with a number of companies, including Intel. So IMEC publishes roadmaps which are overarching that the entire industry can refer to. Fabrication is far larger than just Intel, AMD and Nvidia. It includes TSMC, Samsung, Apple, Arm, and a host of other companies, including, of course, the companies that actually manufacture the equipment that is used in the fabs. The world of silicon chips is in a constant state of progress and advance. So let's see how this affected Intel. In 2008, when Pat Gelsinger was Intel's chief technology officer, he was quoted as saying that Intel saw a clear way towards the 10 nanometer node. Then in 2009, Gelsinger left Intel, apparently because the graphics project he was working on was a crashing failure. Nobody in the industry blames Gelsinger for this failure, it was the technology at fault. Gelsinger first worked at EMC and then moved on to VMware. We'll be meeting Pat Gelsinger again in 2021 when he returns to Intel as Chief Executive Officer. In those intervening years, Intel made absolute fortunes. A quick flick through their accounts shows them absolutely printing money in the tens of billions every quarter, year after year of glowing success. To give you some highlights on the desktop, in 2011, we had Sandy Bridge with four cores up to 3.8 gigahertz on 32 nanometer. Then in 2012, Ivy Bridge also with four cores up to 3.9 gigahertz on 22 nanometer. Haswell with four cores up to 4.4 gigahertz also on 22 nanometer. 2015 was sixth gen Skylake again four cores now at 4.5 gigahertz on 14 nanometer. In the first few days of 2017, we saw 7th gen Kaby Lake, still with four cores, now on 14 nanometer plus. 2017 is significant because AMD launched their Ryzen 7 1800X with eight cores at 4.1 gigahertz on 14 nanometer. In October of 2017, Intel responded to AMD with their eighth gen Coffee Lake, with six cores on 14 nanometer plus plus. In 2018, Intel launched their alleged ninth gen processor, Coffee Lake Refresh, now with eight cores, but still on 14 nanometer. 
This was the point where we started to wonder what on earth was going on with Intel and just how high AMD might rise. This was also, incidentally, the time when Raja Kaduri left AMD for Intel to work on graphics. Was Raja incompetent at AMD or just very unfortunate? Did he inherit a terrible project or uh, did he basically break things? Uh, so if the DGPU from Intel turns out in 2020 to be a good thing, then Raja gets a gold star on the chart. If it turns out to be not up to snuff well that's going to say something against Raja. I'm using those desktop processors to illustrate the problems that Intel suffered for a great many years. In one sense they were stuck on 14 nanometer, in another bigger sense they were stuck unable to move on to new designs that required 10 nanometer. Either way Intel was stuck but there was a far more dramatic impact occurring over on the data center and workstation side of things. This is where these companies really make their money. Processors can cost up to $20,000 per piece. That's the list price. Even if you offer a massive discount, you're still talking many thousands of dollars per processor. In 2019, AMD had their Epic 7002 series with up to 64 cores. By comparison, Intel was struggling and it wasn't until 2021 they were able to launch their third gen Xeon scalables with up to 40 cores, so they were trailing AMD by a substantial distance. In 2022, AMD launched the Epic 9004 series, up to 128 cores and 256 threads, and it's only this year, 2023, that Intel has finally released 4th Gen Xeon Scalable, aka Sapphire Rapids, with up to 60 cores, although the models you'll typically see on sale have somewhat fewer cores than that. This delay in the shift from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer in the new designs, it took a long while for the impact to show up in Intel's balance sheet, but show up it did. If we look at the figures from 2020, Intel was doing okay. However, AMD had been taking chunks out of Intel in the data center, both in terms of market share and also impacting their once huge margins. Where Intel used to regard 60% as a reasonable margin, in 2020 they're down to 34%, in 2021, 24%. 2022 is when things fall to pieces. Operating income is down 84% and the margins are absolutely appalling. And the first quarter of 2023 looks even worse. Pat Gelsinger returned to Intel as CEO in 2021 and you have to wonder whether the seismic event that changed things was Apple ditching Intel in favour of their own silicon and Intel's roadmap was clearly the focus of his attention. The fact that Intel is stating publicly we remain confident we will regain process leadership is an acceptance of their colossal problems. But what is all this talk of Intel 7, Intel 4, Intel 3, 20A and 18A? In essence, Intel has reset things by ditching the nanometer part of the numbering process. 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer don't particularly mean anything, so they've changed the names, they've shifted the pitch. Now the processes are Intel 7, Intel 4, Intel 3, and then we move to the Angstrom era 20A and 18A, which are effectively 2 and 1.8 nanometer. And then, once Intel starts to deliver on their roadmap, they claim, look, we have great products coming. And with great products, we'll have great growth. 2021 might be ropey, 23 should be okay, 2026, look to the future, things will be fabulous, they claim. Not only will they have great products on the desktop, but they'll also have superb data center products, including graphics. They have fabs all around the planet, including America and the EU, as well as Israel and China. They have a partnership with Tower Semiconductor. They have mobile products in self-driving cars, and they have Intel Foundry services. In other words, Intel will manufacture your designs in their fabs. They've been doing that forever, but they're making a big deal of this, separating the fabs from the design part of the equation. And look, in the future, Intel's going to have absolutely wonderful products to offer. Intel has continued leadership in packaging. It has a clear path to process performance in 2025, and it has a clear, consistent, and meaningful node naming framework. Trust us, what's not to like? The task facing Gelsinger and his troops at Intel is straightforward. It looks monumentally difficult, but it is straightforward. And that task is to deliver 
on their roadmap. So let's see what that entails. The 10 nanometer super thin process is now behind us. This slide from 2021 said it was in high volume production in three different fabs, and indeed it was. The Intel 7 process, this slide dates from July 21, was then listed as offering an improvement over 10 nanometer super thin. Intel 7 is the current process, this slide sounds correct. The Intel 7 process was used in Alder Lake, which has since been replaced by Raptor Lake, and is about to be reused in Raptor Lake Refresh. Meanwhile, Sapphire Rapids has only very recently arrived. Then we move on to the future, albeit the relatively near future. Intel 4 is the process that's going to use EUV. Meteor Lake is a laptop processor, and we're expecting to see that later this year. We do not expect to see Meteor Lake on the desktop, however. Granite Rapids would appear to be a little bit off in the future. It may well be sampling at present, however we're not going to see it anytime soon. Intel 3 looks like an incremental improvement on Intel 4. The main thing here being an increased use of EUV. In other words, more layers of the processor will be manufactured using EUV. It's entirely possible in the first instance EUV will be used on 4 or 6 layers of a processor. So if they stretch that to 8 or even 10, then they will be sticking to their roadmap. However, the 18% improvement in performance per watt, that is something we'll actually be able to measure. And it's when things move on to the 20A era that they get truly interesting. This chart shows the process innovations, different kinds of transistors at different processes over the years, and the movement away from planar transistors, i.e. 2D transistors, to finfets and then superfins, i.e. 3D transistors. When Intel moves to 20A, they'll be using ribbon fets or gate all round. Other manufacturers refer to this technology as nanowires. Power veers are a wholly separate technology to transistors. It's a way of delivering power around the chip without interfering with signal. It's the equivalent of putting lift shafts through a building. However, the backside power delivery system, that is wholly new. This is the equivalent of having two chips sandwiched together, one side of the chip handling power, the other side handling signal. As to the advantages of ribbon FETs, well, we won't know until we see them. And you will note, ribbon FETs promised for H1 of 2024. Of course, we don't know whether they mean sampling in test production or in volume production, but the fact is Intel is stating for the public record there will be ribbon FETs in the first half of next year. And then the 18A process follows on in early 2025. At this point, they are clearly getting very quiet about the specifics. One thing to note in the beyond 2025 is stacked gate all round. This sounds like a further improvement in Intel's packaging technology, where they will be literally adding layers of processors together, stacking them rather than manufacturing them as a monolithic whole. That sounds like a huge number of bold claims, and they are coming thick and fast. And the thing is, some of those claims are things we'll actually be able to measure when we finally get our hands on those products. Even better than that, those products are coming soon. If you've made it to this stage in the video, then I congratulate you. And by now, I hope you are screaming at your monitor saying, for goodness sake, Intel was stuck at 14 nanometer for what seems like an absolute age. They've only just delivered what they call 10 nanometer and is now known as Intel 7. How on earth can we have any faith in Intel 4, Intel 3, 20A, 18A, and Intel Next? And for that matter, what is Intel Next? I'm going to throw you a bone on that one. Intel Next, it sounds to me as though it's going to use a technology called pattern shaping. And if you know anything about lithography whatsoever, that should be interesting. To answer the question, how on earth is Intel going to deliver five nodes in four years? More importantly, why should we have any faith in their claims? We had a conversation with Dr. Ryan Russell. He has an incredibly grand title, Corporate Vice President and Co-General Manager, Logic Technology Development. And I have to say, after our conversation with him, He's a top bloke. So here's the cut down roadmap. Intel 7 at present, Intel 4 any day now, then 3, 20A, 18A, and Intel next. How can we have any faith that this is anything other than pie in the sky? The piece of information I did not previously have is that Intel has a test chip they call Blue Sky Creek. 
This is to test Powervia in practice. In other words, they're not just going to roll out ribbon FETs and Powervia stroke backside power simultaneously. They've tested the one part and now they can do the other part. This makes perfect sense. It doesn't mean that necessarily any part can be achieved, not until we see them, but it does at least give you hope that Intel is talking sense. Furthermore, they claim both 20A and 18A are on schedule. You'll note 20A manufacturing ready half one of 2024, 18A manufacturing ready half two 2024. Now 18A, as I've already said, sounds like an incremental improvement on 20A. So the idea it can follow on close behind, well, that's not perhaps such a shock. But even so, two processes in one year. You will note we have further information there on 18A, including the fact that PDK.5 has been released to customers. PDK is Process Design Kit, or the library of tools that customers require to design chips using 18A. It was not crystal clear whether these are internal customers, i.e. Intel's own designers, or external customers. Perhaps it is both. Intel's also making a big deal out of the fact they say they are de-risking, which is a horrible term, 20A and 18A, which once again sounds like this Blue Sky Creek test chip that they've been working on. And here we have the summary. Intel 7 is in high volume manufacturing today. Intel 4 manufacturing ramp has started. Intel 3, they're saying manufacturing ready in the second half of this year. Well, we are in the second half of this year. Intel 20A and Intel 18A, both manufacturing ready for next year. And here we have a list of the products that will appear on each of those nodes. So while we have to take a certain amount of this on trust, Intel is standing by their claims. Five nodes in four years, they say. Yup, that's a thing. But let's suspend our disbelief for a minute or two. Not that we have the slightest reason to be charitable, let us take it on trust that Intel will indeed deliver to their roadmap. The next question is, does this actually matter? The thing of course is that Intel is not working in isolation. They're claiming that they're going to get process leadership. Clearly this means over both TSMC and over Samsung, which in turn means that they're going to reclaim the product lead from AMD, Apple, Tesla, Meta, Amazon and a number of other companies. And what do we think of that? Dr. Lisa Su, chair and CEO of AMD, is clearly on a tear. For the last six years, AMD has been telling us they've delivered on technology after technology, which clearly takes advantage first of Global Foundry's process technology and then TSMC's. And this in turn has led them to have product leads in the data center, client, both laptop and PC, gaming, as we know, every console worth owning is run on AMD hardware and embedded. And the consequence of this is that AMD has been making serious money for the first time in a very long while. Admittedly, recently revenue has dipped, but this has been true across the industry, but AMD has been doing very nicely. Admittedly, the last few quarters look slightly concerning, but AMD seems confident that 2023 is going to uptick very shortly. And what about this man, NVIDIA's Jensen Wang? If Intel's had a bit of a mare recently, and AMD's doing okay but has had a bit of a pause, NVIDIA is doing extraordinarily well. And this growth is driven by the data center. NVIDIA is making fortunes out of AI hardware, and they intend to make fortunes more over the next few years. Forget about crypto mining, it's AI all the way. But it's not just graphics chips. NVIDIA is trying to own the data center. They are even huge in networking. Networking! In addition to GPUs, they have DPUs and processors, and they have an enormous portfolio of both hardware and software. And we saw how this manifested itself at Computex just last month. Let's get to my conclusion after some 22 or 23 minutes of video. Intel states they are aiming for parity with Samsung and TSMC by the end of 2024 and leadership in 2025. I think that is possible. Last year, the year before, I, I would have said that sounded ridiculous. It seems to me that Gelsinger is determined to get back on track. Uh, so for example, Rialto Bridge, the graphics following on from Ponte Vecchio, 
cancelled, gone. Uh, they are removing distractions, which is why we're not going to see new uh, desktop chips on the desktop uh, this year. Which, on the other hand, means, of course, LGA 1700 has another year of life. So, in a sense, good. Uh, but Intel, I think, is focused as they haven't been focused for a very long time. But of course, they are focused in the x86 world and the world is not x86. In the future, we expect, say, quantum computing will come along and change everything. But before that, there's a very decent chance that RISC-V will change a huge amount of the world, you know, ARM and such like. Intel may indeed fight back against AMD in the data center on the desktop and in laptops, but to my eyes it seems as though that doesn't mean they will reclaim market share in the data center. I think it means they will slow the rate at which they are losing share in the data center. It was looking a year or two ago as though in time AMD might potentially own the entire thing, just as Intel has owned it for many years. Perhaps not all of it, but a significant portion. Now I think it's going to end up say around the 50 50 mark in the near future where it goes after that not so sure clearly desktop pcs continue to dwindle they are mainly enthusiast machines for gamers and also for content creators so to me the pc is a very dear thing uh, i currently run on amd and i don't see why i'd return to intel in the near future i think one of the dividing lines is going to be over the next year or two accelerators and ai both Intel and AMD have put their toe in the water with laptop hardware, but we need to see where that one goes. I know none of us want to care about AI. However, none of us can ignore it. It is inevitable. Uh, so it's entirely possible there's going to be a pivot there and one or other of the companies is just going to eclipse uh, their competitor uh, with some clever design. That has to be possible. Again, though, it doesn't seem hugely likely to me. And then we have NVIDIA. NVIDIA wants to own the data center. I'm quite sure NVIDIA would be very happy if everybody ditches the PC altogether, maybe even the laptop, and just runs around holding a phone hooked up to the NVIDIA cloud. I'm sure that would please Jensen Wang hugely. Looking purely at the technology side of things, I struggle to believe that Intel is going to beat out both TSMC and Samsung and return to its glory days. However, we also have to bear in mind the political side of things. Both TSMC and Samsung are very close to the PRC. Intel, on the other hand, is busy building fabs. They're updating the fab in Ireland. They're updating their fab in Israel. They want to build a fab in Germany. They are building fabs in North America, as indeed is TSMC. And the American government is handing out an awful lot of money Intel, of course, manufactures chips where NVIDIA, for example, does not. Intel is in a different position when it comes to receiving money from the American government and indeed from the EU. And I think that might be their saving grace. Uh, so let's hope the geopolitical situation doesn't go all horribly wrong. Uh, but as things stand, I think Intel has trouble. And sadly, I think if the world hits trouble, Intel is going to come out of that better than their competitors. And that feels like a very uncomfortable state of affairs. Let me end on a high note. Intel five nodes in four years? Yes, I think this is highly possible.